Um, so I'm going to try to tell you a story about silica today uh, and how it actually helps or hurts in our understanding of early life. And I'm not going to go without mentioning Mars because trying to understand uh, silica and life on early Earth is all part of a bigger question. It's really part of a question that is best stated, you know, to what extent can we determine the potential for preservation of biologic materials, so read the preservation of life in geologic materials? Because right now we have a lot of interest in trying to uh, understand the question of habitability on other worlds. And we have uh, the current Mars Curiosity rover, the one on the left there, that's been on Mars since 2012. Uh, and that's when I started getting involved in Mars. And then we'll have uh, a, an as of yet unnamed rover, the Mars 2020 rover that will be launching this summer. Uh, the Mars 2020 rover actually has a very different mission. It is actually the first of a, of a three mission pattern where the Mars 2020 rover will actually go investigate an area of Mars for uh, potential habitability and will actually be collecting geologic samples. And then we will have two other missions that will go and collect those samples from us and ultimately, long after I retire, bring them back to Earth. So there, it's actually the first sample return mission from Mars. And the question that we want to ask is, was there life on Mars? And so intimately, we have to understand if you're just going to send a rover that has eh, you know, a little bit of analytical equipment, but mostly cameras, how can you look at a rock and say, is this the rock sh that I should bother to take home with me? Okay, so that's the sort of question, uh, the bigger question that we're looking at. And we're going to start with two elements. We're going to start with microbes, and we are going to start with silica. So the first question is, why microbes? Uh, so, so this is, we've often heard of the tree of life. Uh, that we had Luca, or the last universal common ancestor, and then that split off into the different branches of life. Well, all of the brown here is stuff that we knew about going up to the green. So the brown branches are the bacteria and the archaea. These are all things that we would consider microbes. And then this green sort of tuft at the end are eukaryotes. These are, these are us and everything that we descended from. So these are nucleated cells. This is all multicellular life. But in this picture, I also have this bl these blue branches, these purple branches, these bright green branches. In the last 10 years, we have discovered much more about microbial life on Earth. And there seems to be many, many more branches to this tree than we previously knew. And because we can use the distance down the stem that these branch off as an indication of, of history, we see that early in Earth's history, it was mostly the bacteria and the archaea. It was the microbial world that dominated the Earth. And so we can reasonably infer that if we were looking for life on another planet, and particularly if we we're looking early in that planet's history, which in the case of Mars is what we do, because Mars right now is inhospitable to life. But Mars in the past probably had a thicker atmosphere, had warmer temperatures, may have had liquid water at the surface. And so we're really thinking about life on Mars in terms of life in the ancient Martian past, that microbes might be a good place to, to start. Microbes also give us a lot of fodder to play with. Uh, microbial systems, and I have a little picture of a microbial mat up here, and we can see all of these different colors from oranges at the top to greens to sort of pinky purples to black. We have lots of different layers within a microbial mat because in this wide diversity of microbial life, we have organisms that utilize uh, for their metabolism lots of different chemistries. And so they tend to live along environmental gradients, and they tend to partition themselves in layers where each group is using some chemicals as input to their metabolic systems and exporting some chemicals as a result of their metabolic systems. And then the next layer is using those results from, from the metabolic system as the input to their metabolic system. And so we can see this in just sort of a diagram on the right with, with words saying lots of different types of bacteria. Cyanobacteria, those are the ones that use light and harvest light to photosynthesize. 
heterotrophs are things that eat other bacteria. Nitrogen fixers take nitrogen from the atmosphere that goes into the ocean and makes it biologically available for other organisms. Uh, and oxygenic phototrophs. These are organisms that utilize light, so they still have to be up near the surface, but they can't live where there's oxygen. And so they live far enough down in the mat that there's no oxygen, but there's still light penetration. And they make their living. And then you have purple, green, um, non-green sulfur bacteria, sulfate reducers, methanogens, lots of different types of organisms that can all live within millimeters of the sediment surface in a mat. And this is wonderful because if you're going to go to a different planet, this gives us a lot of fodder. We have not only the organisms themselves, but all of their chemical byproducts. And chemical byproducts can get trapped in geologic materials, can get trapped in rocks. And so we can pick up ancient rocks and learn something about uh, the biology that might have been there. So that's why microbes. The other question is why silica? If we think about silica today, uh, silica in the oceans is used by some animals to make uh, their skeletal uh, bits. We have radiolaria and diatoms, which are single cell organisms, but they make these beautiful skeletal elements uh, out of silica. We have things like the glass sponges. But we're going to be talking about the ancient Earth, long before any of these animals had actually evolved. And what we see in the oceans today is silica using life, or life, using silica to make skeletons. Let's think a little bit more broadly about silica. Because when you think of, start thinking about other planets, somebody said, well, maybe there's silicon-based life. OK, there's a lot of you know, undergrads get younger every day. A lot of young people in this room. OK, anyone watch old Doctor Who's? Yeah, you know Doctor Who's. You know, there's always this question in, in our science fiction about, about silica-based life forms. If we want to go back even further, we go to James T. Kirk and the Horta. And you're laughing because you know the Horta. This is a silicon-based life form that can tunnel through solid rock. You know, and so we need to imagine, you know, when we start thinking about the potential of life on another planet, we always put in this trite little phrase, as we know it life as we know it. But we also want to think about the potential of life not as we know it. So we're going to spend a couple minutes thinking about silica-based life. What are some things that may make silica interesting? Well, silica is incredibly abundant. It's the eighth most abundant element in the universe. Okay, Silica everywhere. There's no shortage of it anywhere in the universe. Okay, It is tetravalent simply means you don't even have to remember high school chemistry. It has four electrons in its outermost uh, electron shell. Now, you may say, OK, fine, it's tetravalent. But so is carbon. And one key about having four electrons in your outer shell is it allows silicon or carbon to bind with a wide range of other elements in a stable form. So that's really cool. So in that, those ways, you know, silicon and, chem and carbon are very, very similar. Uh, silicon can form long chain polymers, as does carbon. And when you make silica, it can make uh, many different topologies or many different shapes, as can carbon. So, you know, this may think, OK, you know, maybe there are enough similarities that we should think about silicon as a potential basis for life. Um, I would say no. <laughs> I would say this is a nice thought process, but it's, it's not going to work. Um, because as it ends up, silica makes a really good mineral. It doesn't make good life. Now, I may change my mind in another decade. There's actually incredible work being done now, uh, particularly at Caltech, looking at silicon carbon bonds. Uh, they have now, we have now found for the first time uh, silicon deposits inside of microbial cells. This is something that five years ago we didn't know about. And so things are changing very rapidly, but there are some negative aspects about silica. Okay? So silicon has a low solubility in water, at least the water uh, like most surface waters, waters of a moderate pH. If we go to very alkaline waters, if we go to a pH of 12, 
you know, something really nasty that you wouldn't want to walk in, yeah, silica's fine in that. But if we look at, at most of the surface waters on the Earth, there's such low solubility, there isn't much silicon. When you have silicones or polymers made of silicon oxygen, they're very unstable in water. They fall apart very easily. If you look at silanes, silicon bonded with hydrogen, they actually react explosively with water. And so you can start seeing why silicon wouldn't necessarily make good life, because cells are 75, 85% water. Uh, so you start having problems. But the biggest problem is that silica has a great affinity for oxygen. So it oxidizes really ready, readily, and when it oxidizes, it forms a solid. So if we think about carbon, when carbon oxidizes, it forms carbon dioxide. That's a gas. And so you can bring carbon dioxide in and out through permeable cell walls. When silica reacts with oxygen, it forms a solid. You can't really push a solid through your cell walls. So metabolically, it's not, it's not very good. So I think that we can throw away the idea, at least for now, of silicon-based life forms. But silica makes a really good mineral. And it makes a really nice, stable mineral in its simplest form, silicon dioxide, otherwise known as chert. Uh, and this is a very stable mineral that can protect evidence from life. So we're going to think about silica in terms of the preservation of life. We can see this today. We can go someplace like the Yellowstone Hot Springs. And so this is Grand Prismatic Springs at Yellowstone. And all of these different colors that you see are here, all of the yellows, the oranges, the browns, are all different type of microbial mats dominated by different types of microbes. And they're partitioned essentially based on heat, based on uh, because this is a very hot spring. And so you have the microbes that are tolerant to high amounts of heat closest to the water. And then as the water drains away, it cools. And we see a dominance of different microbial types. Is, is it OK to interrupt? Absolutely. Other than silicon um, dioxide, are there silicon carbon hybrid molecules that may not be quite so, uh, the, may, may be more water soluble? Well, so bi biologists at Caltech right now are enticing those molecules. The science is so new, I know nothing about it. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we, have, so we have lots of microbes in a place like uh, Grand Prismatic Hot Springs, but these hot waters also have, they're alkaline, they have a pH of, of about 11, they have a lot of silicon in them, and when they cool, that silica precipitates as a mineral phase. And so we can actually pull out microbes from these springs, stick them under the SEM, and we see the remnant of this filamentous microbe here, you know, it's about four or five microns in diameter, and it's actually been entirely encapsulated by silica. So we can see that silica can protect microbes, and if you went to another planet, even if that organic matter had decomposed and long since gone away, if you found this little tubule and brought that home and stuck it under a microscope or an SEM, you would be able to say that with, with a lot of certainty that biology had been there. Okay, so we can use the silica to teach us something. Well, on Earth, silica is actually considered the holy grail. Okay, so this is one of our earliest evidences of life on Earth. It's about three and a half billion years old. Uh, it is an organically stained filament uh, within silica. So this is actually looked at through a transmitted light microscope and then a little drawing of what this filament uh, looks like. And so we can go back to our very oldest rocks, three and a half billion years old. The Earth is only four and a half billion years old. So we can go back to some of the oldest rocks on the face of the planet, and we find things that look like microbial life, but only preserved in silica. And so that says, OK, silica. We like silica. We want that more of this. And then if we go to Mars, it's actually a picture we took last year with the Curiosity rover of a target we called Lemus on Mars. This rock, we see it has very fine layers in it. That looks just like the, a lot of the rocks that we're seeing in the area where the Curiosity rover is. They're fine deposits of fine grain material that were deposited in the bottom of a lake. Except that this particular rock is 97% silica. 
And so we're drooling over this saying, if we brought this home, if we could bring this home, if we, had, if we were Star Wars or Star Trek and we could transport this automatically back home, would we find evidence for life on Mars and a rock like this? So we can see how all of this different science is blended together. You know, we, we want to think about silica as a potential basis for life. We want to see how it can actually help preserve the life as we know it. And we want to say, well, is this a reasonable target if we're going to go to another planet? You know, should we pick a rock made of silica rather than some other rock to bring home? And ultimately, when it comes down to it, for the Mars 2020 rover, we're going to have 20 rocks that we're going to collect. And if we collect 20 rocks and then we find silica, we're all just going to sit there and say nasty words because we have no mechanism of throwing out a rock that we've already collected to collect something better. You know, so we have to make all of these decisions before we go. OK. But there, could there be problems with this? And I, I give you this picture again because the answer is yes, there are a lot of problems with this. Uh, there have been more papers than I can count written about this single rock. It is insane the number of papers that are written about this. Because is this life? Is this actual microbial life preserved in this rock? Well, it certainly looks like a filament. It's about the size of a bacterial filament. The way Bill Schaff has drawn this, it actually looks like it has, has cellular divisions so that you actually have a line of cells. That would be consistent with a microbial origin. And yet there are a lot of people that say, no, this is simply an artifact. That is not actually evidence of life at all. Or that it's only a second sort of happenstance evidence for life. That maybe there was some sort of tubular feature in here, but it rotted away completely. And that the actual brown staining that we see, which is organic matter, actually has a different source completely that might be 2 billion years younger. It might be hydrocarbons, oils, that are migrating through the rocks when they're buried under the earth. We don't know whether or not this is actually life. So, to start to address this question, what do we do? Well, clearly what we don't do is go to the oldest. I mean, this is sexy. This is how you get your nature and your science papers, and this is how you get promoted, is you write about these. But if you actually want to learn about the system, let's look someplace where we have silica and life that nobody's going to argue about. <laughs> you know, let's look at something where, where the biological aspect is unambiguous. And so for this, I'm going to actually break out of my show because I have to go to, if it lets me, oh, please let me. Um, no, no, I had it up here. Oh, it changed my format of my screen. OK, uh, there we go. Wait, no, come back. OK, so we're going to go to a different site, and we're going to look at this. So this is actually what's known as a gigapan image. It is a slice of a rock that's about 30 microns thick, so it's transparent, and it's glued to a piece of glass. This is what we use to look under a microscope at rocks. And so this is, we have a one millimeter scale, so this is a couple of centimeters each direction. And this is a mosaic made up of about 9,000 pictures. And the reason why this is so spectacular is we can look at this whole, you know, two by three centimeter rock, but then we can actually go in and, and look in great detail at small portions of this rock. Uh, so this rock is actually only about a billion years old. Not three and a half billion like that last one, only a billion years old. Well, a billion years is still pretty old, but by a billion years ago on Earth, we actually had more than just microbes on Earth. We also had uh, eukaryotes, so we had nucleated cells. We had just evolved our first multicellular algae. So we have things that are unambiguously recognized as life. Uh, in this picture, we see a number of different colors. We see some clear, some bright white, white, which are just voids that have silica in them. We see gray, which is calcium carbonate, a mineral that's very common in marine environments. 
and then we see brown. And that brown is organic staining from these microbial mats. So we can actually go, and I'll go to a couple of my favorite places. We could go to this area right down here, and we could just start blowing it up and blowing it up and blowing it up. Gigapans are amazing. Until we can see our microbial mat. And what, in fact, we see are a number of sheaths of filamentous microbes. And the small ones are about 10 microns in diameter. The larger ones, 20 or 25 microns in diameter. And we can actually see all of these interacting with each other. We also have uh, some small coccoids or coccoidal bacteria here. Uh, if we move over to the right, um, we actually have a number of, of different types of bacteria. Here we have some, some little spheres, some little coccoidal bacteria. This one is actually sort of interesting. You can't see it really well uh, in this image because it's going down into uh, the thin section, but uh, it's a coccoidal cell. That little dot in the middle is just all of the cytoplasm that when the cell dies, it all just sort of crumbles up into the middle. Uh, and then it has a sheath. And then the sheath, if we were able to see it in three dimensions, would actually look like a bunch of stacked ice cream cones. And this is a particular type of cyanobacteria that doesn't like to get its hair wet uh, or messy. <laughs> um, it actually props itself up off of the substrate. So it has the cell that's photosynthesizing. So it wants to stay up and see light. And if there's a lot of sediment that's coming down threatening to bury it, it pushes uh, what's known as EPS, it's essentially microbial mucus, it's polysaccharides, other things, it pushes that down into the substrate to prop itself up out of the substrate so it can have access to light. This is an unambiguous biological system that we're looking at. And it's about a billion years old. We can move to other places in here and say, well, you know, mats shift. If I come up, I believe it's up over here, you know, oh, there's a whole little pocket of little coccoidal bacteria that are living in this part of the mat. You know, so we have a lot of different things going on in this mat. So, but this mat is preserved in silica. So what do we do? We go back, we ignore the messiness of our desktop right now. Uh, <laughs> we go back and say, you've seen the gigapan image. So what do we want to do? Well, the first thing we want is a lot more samples of this. Uh, I, the sample that I just showed you was something that I collected in graduate school about 27 years ago now up in the Canadian Arctic. Um, and my main interest at the time was not this chert. I picked up a few pieces of it because my advisor said, if you see black chert, pick it up. It'll have microfossils. I was like, yeah, what do I care? Um, mm -hmm. And so I picked up a few pieces. But when you're in the Canadian Arctic, you move around by helicopter. You can only carry so much. And so I didn't have very much. The other problem is 25, 27 years ago, we didn't have a lot of the technology that we have today to look at these things. And now we have a whole suite of new technology that it was time to come back at lo and look at these. So I took a handful of my students. Um, so Ashley Manning Berg and, and Jeremy Dunham are two recent studies that both worked on, on shirt. Uh, Jeremy has graduated and I don't know, is trying to find himself in life. Um, Ashley is a young professor at UT Chattanooga. Uh, Jeff Gillido is a former student of mine, but he said, you're going up to the Arctic? I want to come. So he just came for the ride. Uh, he's now a professor at George Mason University. And we went back up 20 years, 24 years after the fact to where I did my own PhD. So we went up to Baffin Island, so 72 degrees north. So we, you fly, you make a number of stops on the way up, you end at Pond Inlet right there, and then take a helicopter to the field area. Um, so you know, it's no fun talking about rocks if you can't actually talk about field work. Uh, this is the fine little hamlet of Pond Inlet. On the last 20 years, it's, it's gotten huge. When I used to work up there, it was less than 500 people. Uh, it is now about 2,000 people. It's absolutely huge now. Um, so you, you land in Pond Inlet, get everything together, wait for your helicopter. You look at the view across the bay at a glacier coming off the island. An absolute beautiful place. And then, so you start up in Pond Inlet up there. Then you take a helicopter flight. And we came down here to this area just south of White Bay. 
Um, so when I did my, my PhD, I worked from over here in the basin. Uh, so this little peninsula would come down here, and then I worked a little bit to the west of that, and then all the way to the cliffs along Tay Sound here. Um, this time, helicopters have also gotten a lot more expensive. We didn't have, it's 2,500 bucks an hour. It's, yeah, they're not cheap. We didn't have a lot of time, so we made one single campsite and just essentially worked from here to here and hiked it uh, the whole time we're out there. Does the cold help preserve this at all, or is that irrelevant? I think that that's pretty much irrelevant, but we will see later how climate change has affected the world. Yeah, so when you get up there, this is what the Canadian Arctic looks like. So this is our, our car. That is what we lived with um, for, um, we're actually only up there for four weeks this time. I used to go up for nine weeks at a time. Uh, and, and this is the tundra. There's really not much there. So you, the helicopter goes away. You make camp. This is facing the other direction. This is actually about 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, so the sun doesn't go down. You can work at any time of the day or night. Um, our, two, our two campsites, some extra fuel, and then it's down over this ridge uh, is where our cooking spot is because you have to keep your cooking stuff far enough away from your camp because there are things like polar bears and stuff that you have to be concerned about. Um, our only visitor was, was a baby Arctic fox who on a series of incredibly wet, windy, nasty, cold days would crawl under the the rain fly for our tent and curl up and sleep next to us. We named, we named her shirt. Um, so so uh, this is the area where we were. The red dot is where our camp was. So that was that lake that we saw in the background. Uh, the arrows point to some areas that we specifically went. Uh, to get from this dot over to here, hiking across tundra is about a four hour hike. Okay, it's not easy to walk up there, but the sun doesn't go down. So you walk for four hours, you work for 10 or 12, and then you walk back, and it's all, you know, the light doesn't change, doesn't matter. Um, and you do work, and we just collected shirt. So here is, is Jeff uh, by a rock. Now this rock is sideways. These layers, uh, if they were still up in the cliff, would be horizontal. Um, but it's this dark black stuff that we're looking for. So all of the brown and the white is limestone or calcium carbonate, and then the black are these bands of silica. Uh, so you can see with Jeff the important things. Um, he's wearing gloves, so even in midsummer, it's still chilly up there. He's wearing mosquito netting, keep that in mind. Uh, he has his gun, well, my gun. Actually, no longer my gun, because they completely screwed up my flights and I got back to Montreal at the end, and my gun was still in pond, and it's illegal for Canada to transport a gun across the US border. And so I'd either have to fly back to Canada to get my gun or get rid of it, so I just let him keep it. I'll buy another. Um, um, and a rock hammer and backpack to carry everything. Now, I keep talking about how we want to be able to look at a sample and try to tell what's in it. And that's not easy to do, but there are some things that we've learned um, over the last 20 years. So here's a close-up of some rock. There's my boot in the background and with the shoelace for scale. Um, these little black dots are just lichen that are living on the rock. But this blacker area is some of the silica, is this chert, and then there's brown and white layers of the limestone. But we can actually see that there's a similarity in fabric between these very nice, clear, even little layers of brown and white and these nice, clear layers that we see in the shirt. When we see this, these beautiful, smooth layers that can be you know, smaller than half of a micron or half of a millimeter that we can follow along, they're actually telling us something about what's in that rock. And what we have learned by looking at enough samples when we get home is that that smoothness and uniformity of laminae is usually indicating an absence of biology. It's usually indicating abiotic mechanisms. 
And in fact, when we take this chert and cut it open and look at it under a microscope, what we see is something like this. And this is actually the growth of little crystals, long skinny crystals that grow upwards. There's still a lot of organic staining. So there's still organic matter in the environment. But the fabric that we're seeing is dominated by a chemical signal of mineral precipitation. If we look at something like this instead, so we have brown and white, but we see how irregular this brown and white fabric is. We see how irregular the lamination in the shirts. This is a much more convincingly microbial fabric. And in fact, when you cut these open, this is what you see, a, a microbial mat much like the last sample that I showed you in the gigapan, where we have these sort of 10 micron little filaments, filaments of sheaths, these larger ones, and then here's one of these cockoids that has this interesting EPS sheet that pushes it up and helps it move through the substrate. We also have chert that looks like this. And again, it looks different. So now we still have the same pieces parts of this whole story. We have brown and white making up all of the limestone, but now that brown and white is very patchy and very blebby. And we can actually see that particularly the white blebs, even when replaced by silica, are still these little white blebs. We see the pattern repeated. This is a very different microbial mat. Invariably, when we cut these open, we see mats that are actually made up of cockoids. And so, you know, I would suggest that if we have silica that's preserving these ancient microbial mats, we can actually say something about them even before we bring them home. We find very complex fabrics. This is actually my favorite sample that we found um, three summers ago. And unfortunately, it was too big to carry home. And it was larger than head size. And one hit with a rock hammer, and it broke into about 50 pieces, tiny little pieces. Boom. And I'm like, oh, damn it. Um, so I don't have much of this. I have some little pieces. But this is a very interesting rock, because what we can actually see is a little tuft, a little triangle here, and then sort of a bigger tuft. And then we see these sort of white balloons. Well, those white balloons are actually much like in that gigapan that I showed you. Those are actually little air bubbles in the original microbial mat. And so there would be filaments growing up around them. And one of the byproducts of photosynthesis is oxygen gas. And so you're making oxygen, and then these little bubbles of gases get trapped in the mat. And they're actually being preserved in silica. And having these little, it's sort of about a centimeter and a half tall, tuft is also very common in microbial mats because the filaments move, and then they sort of clump up, and then they grow up and make these little tufts. And so we get an idea, both from the original preservation of uh, or the preservation that we see when we get home and look under the microscope of these mats, that this silica must be preserving things essentially while these mats are still alive. And we have evidence of that even in the field. Uh, this is about 20 centimeters from here to that top uniform layer. Um, this is actually a storm deposit. So this is what you actually see when a big storm comes in onshore, and it actually rips up parts of the substrate and then redeposits them. And so we have ripped up pieces of white material. We have ripped up pieces of this black material. And sometimes it's bent. They're bent. Sometimes they're very angular and blocky. But that means that this silica, this chert, was, was already pretty firm at the substrate when the storm came through. It was already acting a lot like a rock. OK, so we collected a lot more chert. So what do we do then? Well, we bring it home. And what do we do with it once we bring it back? The first thing we want to do is cut it, make it into these thin sections, and look at it under the microscope, because we want to see if they actually do contain these microfossils. What we also want to do is see what else we can see in this chert that might help constrain the original environment in which this silica formed. So remember, these are a billion years old. We don't have a, a magic school bus that we can go back a billion years and find out. We need to look at other evidence. So what do we see? The next four slides sort of focus on what we see. We've seen this picture before. 
a typical mat. What we often see is a microbial mat, and then it's preserved in silica. There are two phases here. One is organic, one is the mineral phase silica. Okay, so that says in this environment, we're probably at the edge of a shallow sea. We had microbial mats growing on the edge of that shallow sea, and we had silica precipitating from the ocean. Yeah? How do we, how do we know that they're microbial mats as opposed to fungal hyphae? Um, well, for these, fungus hadn't evolved yet. Well, you did so, say that the billion-year-old rock had eukaryotes. So yeah, yeah we, do, we do start to see our first eukaryotes. Our first evidence for anything that looks like fungal hyphae is actually substantially younger. Well, about half a billion years younger. But fungal hyphae can also split, so they can also bifurcate, uh, whereas simple filamentous bacteria don't. Um, often, uh, fungal hyphae often uh, the organic material they're made of, they, they, when they die, they collapse very readily. So in fact, the earliest stuff that was thought to be fungal hyphae, I actually thought I had some in these rocks 20 years ago, but I was convinced by people that I was full of it. You, you see where I'm going with that? If they're fungal hyphae, then those peaks might be analogous to the formation of a mu mushroom from the yeah. Yeah, and we're going to let you go ahead and think that, but we're just going to say no. Oh. Went there once, done that, no. But, but, but I won't let you, I, you, we'll talk later about that. Okay, in other samples, uh, you actually see something different. So this sample has a number of microbial elements, and they're, they're not preserved nearly as well. This is actually a coccoidal colony called Entophysalis. Uh, and it notoriously is poorly preserved. Uh, but it likes growing on hard substrates. We have Entophysalis today. We can, we can look at its behavior today. Uh, and it is actually growing on what we call a botryoid, a little uh, semicircular element of fibrous, what was limestone, so calcium carbonate. It is now silica. So here, we actually have evidence that we had a microbial mat in an environment that it was also preci precipitating limestone, calcium carbonate, that was then had silica precipitated, and that silica was able to dissolve the calcium carbonate and precipitate in its place. So all of a sudden, what we're doing is, is using observations to set up a series of chemical equations that we won't talk about. But we're using our observations to set up chemical scenarios. And one of the things that we, we learn when we look at rocks is that rocks see lots of fluids. And so fluids can come in and can dissolve minerals, and fluids can come in and precipitate other minerals. But the rate at which that dissolution and reprecipitation happens is really important. If you go in and dissolve lots of stuff, you end up with a big hole. And when you then fill that hole with other fluids that precipitate minerals, the minerals behave as if that's a hole, and they nucleate on the edges and grow into the void. If we actually preserve the fabric of this original carbonate, what it's actually telling us is that when the silica was coming through, it was essentially dissolving a tiny bit of carbonate and replacing it with silica, dissolving a tiny bit of carbonate and replacing it with silica. It tells us that those two minerals, that the chemistry of the fluid, fluids uh, from which they evolved was very similar to each other. Okay, so it places a constraint on the system. In another picture, we had this. Well, all of these sort of ovoid uh, lenticular little crystals are fascinating because those are diagnostic of the mineral gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. And gypsum only forms from ocean waters in very arid environments when you've had a lot of evaporation. In fact, if you took a bucket of seawater uh, to get calcium carbonate to precipitate, you would have to evaporate off 50% of the water. To get gypsum, you would have to evaporate off 80% of the water. And so it suggests that we're in an environment that would be really, really arid with water that was very salty. And that's actually important because when you evaporate off water, you concentrate other ions like silica. 
Uh, so here we have gypsum, and it is being replaced by silica. Well, we also have things like this. This is a slightly different image. We have some calcium carbonate down in the corner. We have gypsum that is still gypsum, calcium sulfate. And we have this beautiful cube, which is diagnostic of the mineral halite, table salt, sodium chloride. And it has been silicified, but nothing else has. So I talked about our bucket of seawater. 50% evaporation, you get calcium carbonate. 80% evaporation, you get gypsum. You have to be past 90% evaporation. So you have to evaporate out almost all of the water before you start making, making salts, so making halite. But the halite is the only thing in here that's silicified. So the fluid that added the silica was almost as salty as the fluid that precipitated the halite. So we can start to place constraints on the system, and then you know, we take all of that bing, and wrap it up and say, let's do some chemical modeling. And I've only put the results here. <laughs> so, so we have a situation where we think we had shallow water, and it was mixed with ocean water. And that eventually, sometimes when the sea level was a little bit lower, it was probably isolated by a shoal. You can think of it as a coral bank uh, off to the edge. And then you got a lot of evaporation. And so we took our best idea of what the composition of water a billion years ago looks like. Not easy to do. We don't really know what it looks like. We can look at minerals that are about 800 million years old that have tiny inclusions of fluid in. And we can say, OK. Let's say that that's what seawater looked like. And then we can evaporate them synthetically in, in a program. And then we can add fresh water, because if you have this sort of isolated flat with a small puddle of water, if it rains once, you can actually change the chemistry of that water quite dramatically and change its pH. And then at every step of this process, we looked at what minerals were stable. And what we actually found um, and the most important things, we found that carbonate we could form all the time, and that's sort of like, duh, yeah, we knew that. That to get uh, gypsum or halite, it required evaporation. That's another duh, yeah, we know that. So the model is actually telling us what we already know. That's good. It also told us that hydrosilica gel was stable even in unevaporated seawater. So we could have actually made a gooey silica substrate. Um, and that this silica gel and a variety of other silica forms were stable in brines. And you could then even add fresh water to these brines, and they would remain stable. So what this tells us is we could probably make silica to preserve microbial mass, actually not in one environment, but probably in a huge range of environments. But that's important to know. So the next thing we tried to do is say, well, what about that organic carbon that we see in there? And we went back to Mars for a minute and said, how big are Martian samples? Because right now with the Curiosity rover, we can actually do organic chemistry and look at organic molecules in materials. So this is from the Curiosity rover. This is our drill. Uh, and it's a percussive drill. And so it makes a powder. And it actually sucks up the powder into the instrument, puts it through a bunch of sieves. Uh, and then we have a little portioning device. And then we can dump that into a variety of different instruments and get chemical analyses. But the single portion is about 20 to 50 milligrams. That's really small. That's really, really small for if you have very low amounts of organic matter. So we then looked at the stats for the instruments that they're putting on the next rover and the size of the samples that are going to be going back and the amount of material from return samples that we'd be able to use to do these analyses, you know, and it's like five grams. Not a lot of material. So we said five grams. We'll try that. So we took five grams of this chert, powdered it, uh, used a bunch of chemistry to, to bring out all of the organic matter, and then looked at the composition of that organic matter. Um, nothing matters but the purple words. So we found. Uh, a number of long chain alkanes. So these are certain types of chemical compounds. But they tend to be indicative uh, in the pattern that we saw 
of hypersaline environments. We got really excited because it said we have gypsum, we have halite, we know we're in a hypersaline environment, maybe we're seeing what we think we're seeing. Um, we then looked at hopanes and also found things that are thought to be indicative of a hypersaline environment. And we got so excited. We said, yes, this is great. We're actually preserving organic matter faithfully. Then we actually found a huge range of sterines. Sterines are actually made by eukaryotes, not by microbes, only by nucleated cells. And we found a wide variety. And then we started going, oh man, we might be in trouble because if these are real, and if they are inherent within that rock, we would have the oldest found sterines by several hundred million years. And we'd get our nature papers, and we'd get promoted and we'd, to God, and, and everything would work. <laughs> and it's not out of the question, because in these same rocks, there are multicellular alga. This is a, a red alga called Bangia. Um, it's not out of the question that we would have sterines. But then we started looking at our data. We did 20 different samples and the results were the same for all of them. And we said, this is just not right. And we finally decided that everything we were measuring was cigarette smoke. But these rocks had sat in wooden drawers at Harvard University in collections that where old men used to smoke their pipes uh, for 20 years. And we had nothing. But that's why we went back, because we collected new things. We collected new things, and we were really, really careful. And we brought back, and they had nothing. Nothing measurable above background. You could s look down a microscope and see the biology, and we measured nothing, except DEET. We measured insect repellent. But that's because global warming has had an effect on the Arctic. And when I used to work there 25 years ago, there were no mosquitoes. There was nothing. Well, this is what it looks like now. You know, <laughs> uh, you don't, I mean, you wear mosquito netting all the time. You eat by unzipping your mosquito netting and slipping in your spoon. You don't bother with your water. You just drink through the mosquito netting. And, and no matter how careful we were, no matter how many gloves we went through, DEET got on everything but we see nothing. And yet we're looking at rocks where we can see the frickin' biology, and we cannot measure the biology. So this is actually the cool bit, and I know I'm running out of time, but I think I only have like five or six slides left, is there's something I haven't really told you about this, Matt. I said the word, but there may only be a couple people in the audience who caught it, that we have all of these filamentous sheaths it's the word sheaths that's important. Because when you have filamentous microbes, you have chains of little cells, and then they tend to have a polysaccharide sheath around them. Well, when we measure for biomarkers, we're looking for lipids. We're looking for the chemicals that make up the cell walls. The only cell wall that exists anywhere in this image is in that coccoid. All of these filaments the actual cellular filaments have all migrated out. They're not being preserved. And in fact, any microfossils you look at, th at through, through the ancient Earth, they're almost always just sheaths and not the cells. And so we have to start asking what's happening. And so this is where the master's student was doing something different. Uh, most biologists, paleontologists who look at shirt, they cut these thin sections under the microscope pretty thick. They cut them about 80 microns thick because we want to look up and down through them to see the shapes of things because that's very important for diagnosing hyphae versus something else. Um, and nobody had really thinned them down and actually looked at, at the mineral precipitate. So we did. And what he found is that these microbial mats, so we're now looking at just the mineral basis uh, if we, if we did something different with the microscope, we would see all of those same filaments through here. But what we see here are these little X's. These are little spherules. And so this is silica that's making these tiny little balls. And you can look at these under the SEM, 
And again, you see these radiating fabrics. And these actually permeate, if you had a cell, these actually permeate right through um, those sheaths. So they're bigger than the sheaths and they permeate right through. Well, so my student did a lot of crystal size distribution analysis, a lot of other things to look at these, and basically came up with a story that, that in any region, the size of these spheres are almost all the same size. And that actually gives us a lot of information, because if you nucleate one and start to grow it, and then nucleate another and start to grow it, you'll have a mismatch in sizes. So when you have almost all the same size, that means you're nucleating it all at the same time. So you're nucleating all of this stuff, but also they never actually really ran into each other. They didn't intergrow with each other. And so we think that, that these crystalline spheres were actually growing from a silica gel. So you can make uh, SiOH, and you can make all of these polymers. So you have a lot of water and silica. And then different ions will sort of bind these polymers into ladders. And so it makes sort of a matrix, but it would, it would look and feel like jello. And then something happened to that jello, and it crystallized. But that actually explains a lot. And I'm two slides from the end. So we can, we can now set up a story that you had a microbial mat with filaments of the actual cells and their sheaths. You made a silica gel that just permeated all of the space in here. The actual microbes themselves said, ah. That silica gel is keeping the nutrients from getting to me. I'm getting the heck out of here. And they migrated out and went back up out of the silica gel and into open seawater, someplace where they, weren't, where they could actually get the nutrients that they needed without them being barriered by, by the silica gel. So you lose your actual cells. Um, and then the gel goes ahead and permeates all of the space inside of these sheaths. And then at some point, something happens, and you nucleate the crystals, and they start growing. And then they fill up all of the available space. They don't actually bother the sheaths. So we have beautiful preservation of the sheaths. But the actual cells, the trichome of the bacteria, is long gone. And that would explain why we're not measuring things. So what have we learned, good and bad? Chert is amazing. Silica is amazing at preserving microbial morphologies. And we can learn a lot from that. Uh, but their preservation appears to begin with development of a silica gel, followed by crystallization. And that may give us an inherent bias, because at that point that, that all of the fluid, the water and stuff that would be around the microbes turns to jello, the cells say, I don't like this. I'm getting the heck out of here. And so it's biasing it. And this process we can actually see happening today in places like Lake Magadi in Kenya or Lake Natron. Um, and, and so it looks like the process of preserving these exquisite morphologies in silica may also be the fundamental mechanism why we cannot measure lipid biomarkers. And so what this has done is open up a slew of new questions. Um, you know, is this pattern of solidification that we see unique? I've got a new PhD student that started this fall, and she is asking that question. We have a bunch of chirts from all over the Precambrian right now that we're looking at. Um, and if there is a bias against filaments that can move out of a gel, if we actually measured biomarkers on those chirts that contain coccoidal cells, which are non-motile, they don't move, and they have all of their lipids actually trapped inside of them, would we see something different? And we need to try that. And, um, and then we need to understand more, because right now our model for solidification is mostly things like Yellowstone Hot Springs. But you saw in that early picture that encapsulation of cells by silica is very different than this permeation of material by silica. So we have a slew of new questions, and we're working on that now. And with that, thank you. Time for maybe a question, and then perhaps Dr. Kate can stay. I can stick for around. A few moments.
to answer individual questions personally. Do you have to answer these questions before bringing back samples from Mars would make any sense? Or eh, we don't have time to do that. We do everything at the same time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do everything at the same time. I mean, we launch, uh, 2020 launches on July 14th, July 17th, something around there. We will land on Mars middle of next February. Um, so at that point, I'll spend another semester out at, in California at JPL. And within a year, we will have collected all of our samples. We are not going to have these questions answered in a year. We'll try to get there. Can I, this is a little off subject. One thing that makes Mars 2020 different is that the American mission is carrying a helicopter. Yes, Could it is. Could you say just a word about that? It has pissed off a lot of people. Um, <laughs> because, <laughs> no, it really has. Because there's a team that proposed a, a, a drone for the 2020 mission, mission, and that instrument did not get funded. But then the Jet Propulsion Labs at NASA said, they didn't fund it, we're gonna build one anyway. And so the group that's actually building the drone is not the people that actually proposed the drone and there's a lot of bad blood there. But, but it's, it's going to be difficult. I've seen pictures of the drone flying um, in low atmosphere holding chambers because the biggest problem with any sort of a drone and helicopter is, is that you need atmosphere for those blades to push against. And Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere. Okay, and so it's really, really hard, but drone technology has gotten a lot better. They, they first talked to people that were flying drones, places like the high Andes, anywhere where you're at, in, in the Himalayas, anywhere where you're up at elevation, where there's not as much atmosphere. And those people, when drones first came out, said drones are gonna help our science, and they were crashing them left and right and losing them in the glaciers. Um, but, but drone technology has gotten a lot better, and the drone is also not small. The blades are like this long. I mean, they're huge. They're huge. Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm.